for takeoff. Oh, sorry, rockets. There's more urgent business on the science line. Okay, what's going on out there? We've got an investigation for you. Two identical pizzas. Two identical knives. But Jessica can cut hers easily. But Thomas can't. But mine's really hard. You're not pushing down hard enough. I am. I'm pushing as hard as you. But it just won't cut. Stella, we need science in action to investigate. What's going on? I'm on to it. Those knives might look identical, but are they? What if one was pushing harder than the other? This needs a fair test. I've devised the perfect mechanism to make sure I push with the same force on both knives. These masses should help. Their weight, which is the downward force of gravity on them, can be my push. Here goes. A mass of one kilogram means a downward force of 10 newtons pushing on each knife. Not enough to cut through the apples. Let's add some more one kilogram masses. Two kilograms. That's a force of 20 newtons. Using masses like this means I can make sure I push with exactly the same force on each knife. So it's a fair test. So, a force of 70 newtons is enough for this knife to cut the apple. But the other knife hasn't made much headway. It needs a greater force. Sure, I know what you're thinking. This knife is blunt. But what do you really mean by that? Why do sharp edges cut easily and blunt ones don't? Let's take a closer look. In extreme close-up, you can see the cutting edge of a knife isn't totally sharp. It's a very small surface. A sharp knife has a much smaller cutting surface than a blunt one. When you cut, you apply a pushing force to this surface. The larger the surface, the harder you have to push to cut. It's the pressure of the knife on the apple which makes it cut. This pressure depends on both the pushing force and the area of the cutting edge. Hmm. I think we need some more evidence. Well, I tidy up. <laughs> Hmm, Stella's not the only one feeling peckish. Don't mind me. I'm just taking a break with some of my friends, Marlene and her pupils. Marlene's a science teacher. But our peaceful picnic has just been rudely interrupted. Oh, ah. oh, oh. oh I've been stung. What I'd like to know is how a weedy nettle like this can sting a big girl like me. Trish, are you all right? Oh, yes, Marlene. I know it's only a nettle, but it really hurts. How do nettles sting? Well, they may look as if they have smooth leaves, Tris, but just watch this. Wow! It was as if the balloon had been hit by a pin. 
Those nettles must be covered in something pretty sharp. They're covered in thousands of stinging hairs. You only have to brush against them with your skin and they pierce you and inject you with poison. The poison's stored in a bulb at the base of each hair. The tip of the hair pierces the skin. It looks really sharp. Marlene can show me just how sharp it is. Look at the tip compared to a familiar sharp object, a pin. A sharp object? Wow, that's amazing! Even something as pointed as a pin has a flat surface. You actually have to push quite hard on this surface to create enough pressure to pierce a balloon. But a stinging nettle hair pierces a balloon much more easily because it has a smaller surface area at its tip. Yes, in fact, Trish, it's about one-fifth of the size of the pin. And it only has to brush your skin very gently to produce enough pressure to puncture the skin. But not enough pressure to get through these gloves. I think it's about safe to go back to the picnic. Hi, Bill! <laughs> If you stand on something squashy, like sand, you can easily see the pressure caused by your weight acting over the area of the sole of your shoes. It's the pressure which produces footprints. I weigh the same, but my footprint is deeper wearing this than this. The pressure depends on the area of the sole of the shoe. my weight stays the same, if I double the area of the sole of my shoes, I should half the pressure. As the area gets bigger, the pressure gets smaller. So, the footprints from my red shoes are deeper than the green ones. Not really me, are they? But spreading weight like this can be of vital importance in some situations. Woo! Wow! What a great way to travel! Our tank's name is Scorpion, and today it's going to help me with my scientific investigation. Oh no! Can we have our hands? Thanks, Kate. You're better off up here. The tank's specially designed to cope with soft ground. Unlike me, even with my wellies on, or should I say off, I still got stuck. But how does the tank do that? The tank has huge tracks, which means it has a very large area in contact with the ground. The weight of the tank is spread over a very large area. So that reduces the pressure on the ground. That's right. If the tank had normal car wheels, it wouldn't be able to move on any soft ground. It would just sink in. The Scorpion's famous for its very low ground pressure. It's said to be less than someone's foot. Less than someone's foot? This one needs to be investigated. In this, our Science in Action challenge, on one side, we've got Scorpion the tank, and on the other, we've got our surprise contestant, Andrea the Valley Dancer. Thank you very much. Who do you think will have the most pressure on the ground? Both sides are warming up now for a head-to-head. -head. The tank weighs in at a massive 80,000 newtons. Here's Andrea, the ballet dancer, at only 600 newtons. But the tank has huge tracks, a very large surface area. Andrea's secret weapon is that she can stand on one pointed toe, a toe with a very small area. The test we've devised is to run both contestants across some ordinary sheets of polystyrene. The depth of their imprints will show who produces more pressure on the ground. OK, folks, it's the moment of truth. Scorpion, the 80,000 Newton tank with huge tracks from Boverton in Dorset, leaves an impression eight millimetres deep. 
But Andrea, the petite but powerful 600 Newton ballet dancer from Tombridge Wells, leaves a toe print 30 millimetres deep. That's much deeper than the tank. In fact, the pressure of Andrea on her toe is an incredible 17 times the pressure of the tank. Wow, all that pressure for one tiny tootsie. I hope you never stand on my feet. Still wouldn't let a tank run over my foot. No chance. Watch this. If I put the egg on my palm and try to squash it, you can't. Let me have a go. I can't do it either. Maybe it's boiled. Eh. No, not that way round. Hmm. I think I'll use vices to push on my eggs. One mounted long ways on the left and sideways on the right. The vice pushes on the egg and the egg pushes back equally hard. The forces balance. But as I turn the vices, they push the eggs harder and harder. Soon, the right-hand vice pushes so hard that the egg can't match it, and it smashes. But look at the egg mounted long ways. It can push back much more. It takes a lot more force before the egg smashes completely. It's funny to think of something like an egg being able to push as much as a human hand. It's not only eggs that push back. See these books on the table. Don't look like they're doing much. But the weight of the books is pushing down on the table. And that's not all. The table's also pushing back on the books. Imagine what would happen if it didn't. Even these comfy cushions can push back on me. Watch what happens as I sit down. Let's look at that again. At first, my weight is a bigger force than the upward force of the cushion springs, so I go down. But the more squash the springs get, the more they push back. Eventually, the force pushing back equals my weight. The force is in each and I stay put. It's called equilibrium. But does equilibrium mean comfort? To find out, I'm sitting in equilibrium too. The force of my weight pushing downwards balanced exactly by the equal upward force of the chair on my bottom. But after a long flight, that upward force can make things a little uncomfy. I've been jetted into East Midlands to investigate what makes a seat comfortable with Mark Porter, an ergonomist. Ergonomics is the science of making things comfy for people. Oh, that's fine. What I suggest we do to make up time, there's plenty of seats here in the foyer. Why don't you zoom off and have a look around? OK, will you look after my trolley? OK. Well, Mark, there's a range of seats here, but they all feel so different. Yes, let's try an experiment. What I'd like you to do is jump on this high stool. OK. Careful, your legs are dangling. If you <laughs> lean forward, we'll look at your weight. My mass is 76 kilograms, so my weight pushing down on the scales is 760 newtons. I'm at rest, so there's an equal force of 760 newtons pushing up on my bottom. Now if you jump off, we'll, look, we'll go to this lower stool and repeat the same thing. The scales are now showing a reading of 50 kilograms. 500 newtons. Right. If we look at what's happening through your feet, okay. we're now getting a reading of 26 kilograms, that's 260 newtons. The chair pushes up with a force of 500 newtons 
and the floor pushes up with the force of 260 newtons, which adds up to my total weight, 760 newtons. Of course, my weight hasn't changed at all, but it's now balanced by two smaller upward forces. So there's less force on my bottom if my feet are on the ground, which makes it more comfy, actually. Yes, but it's not quite that simple. Back at Mark's lab, this test rig of a car seat can tell us a bit more. Oh, what are these, Mark? You're sitting on a bed of sensors identical to these, and these measure exactly how much and where the seat is pushing up on your bottom. Good, let's go and look at your bum plot, over there. This colour plot shows your seat pressure distribution. Right, pressure. Now that's the force of the chair pushing up, and the area that it's spread over. That's right. Oh. And you can see we're going from high pressure here in the yellow through to the medium pressure in green and the low pressure in blue. And in fact, this shows your contact between your bottom and the seat. Now, what I'm worried about here is you've got very high pressure levels here on the seating bones. Mm, so what does that mean? Well, in the long term, I think you become very uncomfortable. So Mark reclines my seat a little and lowers my legs. So now the force of the chair is spread over a larger area of my thighs and back. The pressure is less, so... It feels a bit more comfy. But does my bum plot agree? Before the seat adjustment and after. No longer the yellow hot spots of high pressure because the upward force of the seat is now spread over a larger area of my body. So Mark, there are basically two main factors the weight of the person and the size of their bottom. Yes, a small woman with a big bottom should have a comfier time than a tall, thin man. So your bum plot is a bit like a fingerprint. Can you predict what someone looks like from it? This is my bum plot. Meet my wife. Hmm. Much less pressure than Mark. She's obviously a lot lighter than him. But I couldn't possibly comment on the size of her bottom. Hi, Trish. Oh, hello. Not a bad guess. We're quite different sizes and I'm about half his weight. But we do have something in common. Oh, what's that? We're both ergonomists. Ergonomists? Both interested in comfort. Not surprisingly, Mark and Sam demand the utmost from their car seat, electronically programmed to slip into the perfect position. Unfortunately, my rocket still seems to be suffering a state of perfect equilibrium. The weight of the rocket exactly balanced by the upward force of the floor pushing back. So it just stays put. But not for long. Now or never, we destroy this equilibrium once and for all. 